Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Curious Competitor podcast where we try to architect our career and our lives uh, to both be as functional and as fun and as successful as possible. On today's podcast, it's going to be a solo podcast where I am going to do a 10 10 10, 10 minutes sort of reviewing uh, what I was trying to study about the trade deadline and some players I thought were interesting that were moved. 10 minutes on a personal update on how my season's going as we uh, near the end here. I think there's 9, 12 games left after this weekend, depending on when you're listening to this podcast. And then I want to uh, follow up with uh, some training advice. 10 minutes to finish there. A lot of kids, a lot of youth sports, a lot of college athletes even are ending their Division One seasons, their AAA seasons, and eyeing up their summer training and trying to make uh, decisions there, who to work with, what to focus on. And uh, I've been there, done that. I, I will be there and we'll be doing that. And uh, so I want to help guide you through this whole measure twice, cut once process that is training in the summer. Very important period of time uh, for athletes. And, it's, and it should be fun. It should be fun. And you should have a high degree of belief in what you're doing uh, if you're able to support yourself with the proper coaching and the proper vision for how you want this, your work ethic to be spent uh, and, and, and how clear uh, this vision is for yourself uh, as a player. So I wanted to discuss first uh, so, uh, the trade deadline, a little bit of a review, um, some different players and some different stories that I remember crossing paths with. The first being uh, Dmitry Orlov going to the Boston Bruins. Uh, I played with Orly uh, way back in the day. Now with the Washington Capitals uh, organization, feels like yesterday. I looked it up. It's actually like nine or ten years ago. Um, I've always enjoyed Dmitry Orlov's game. I think offensively, he's really gifted. He has a tremendous shot. He is a player that I would consider uh, it's become sexy to kind of join the rush and, and have four defensemen in the rush uh, versus being a, like a three-man rush. When I first came in the league, every team now is trying to play a four-on-three uh, rush game up the rink. Dmitry is one of those players, one of those defensemen that he does not just join the rush because the coach sort of uh, drew it up, but he genuinely believes that he can score. He has the offensive ability to, to know uh, and, and command the puck. I thought in the short time I was in Seattle, Mark Giordano was very much this way. There was a certain level of assertiveness and command when they were the fourth player. They wanted the puck. Uh, they expected it. They were good at uh, catching and, and shooting it as they should, either off their both left shots, so kind of like the a dog peeing on a fire hydrant sort of shot where you got the right leg up in the air, uh, or they could catch corral, get it to their toe and do a left foot, you know, right foot sort of Austin Matthews toe drag type shot. Both of them have uh, big bombs of, of shots uh, and are, are similar that way. And something I've always liked about Dimitri's game is come playoff time. This is important. And you see this with the type of player that's acquired. He has some uh, weight to him. He's, he's a bigger guy than maybe you would expect uh, off the ice, he, he's a thick uh, person. He, he trains really hard. Um, he was able to, you know, he's been in the NHL a long time. and He has a, a lot of games played, but I'd imagine, I've never talked to Orly about this, but a lot of his development growing up and in, and in his training was anticipating a bigger, heavier league than what he's playing in now. Uh, luckily, he hedged his bet and also has a, a highly skilled component to his game uh, which I think alludes to his uh, longevity. Uh, an interesting story I thought uh, I would share was Nate Schmidt was in this conversation, Cam Schilling was in this conversation, I was in this conversation, and Dmitry Orlov were, uh, was in this conversation with the Hershey Bears, with the Washington Capitals, playing uh, you know, with the big club, getting sent down. The team would want to do, you know, use a different fit. So there was one point where Orlov was in the minors. I think Nate Schmidt was as well. Uh, and they wanted to call Orlov up. There was, you know, uh, something medically had happened, and I just want to highlight for youth athletes who may be listening to this podcast, I, I, sort of a, 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 I want to give you fair warning that really unexpected bad things will happen in your career, and I give you this piece of advice so you can game plan ahead of time and sort of, understand that really unexpected risks are the norm in your career and not um, as long as you play long enough and not 
something that only happens to you. So Orlov had had you know something go on. I think he was sick. Uh, they decide they wanted to call him up. They decided to go with you know Nate Schmidt, also a tremendous player uh, who's gone on you know currently playing with the Winnipeg Jets. And so Schmidt goes up, plays well. They thought you know Schmidt was just going to be up for the weekend. Orlov was going to get healthy, and then they would you know make the call up they originally intended to. All of a sudden, three months go by. You know, hundreds of thousands of dollars later, and Nate Schmidt, uh, you know, had kind of kept his position, uh, you know, up with you know Washington for that time. And Dimitri was you know kind of grinding away, um, you know, in the minors trying to trying to do his thing. And so it's just kind of a a classic case where you don't know what bounces are going to happen, uh, but it, with proper effort and attitude, you just maximize the surface area of your of your chances to get lucky and be in the right spot at the right time. Um, and so Orlov, who's, you know, gone on to make you know a lot of money, uh, win a Stanley Cup, and, you know, now with Boston has another opportunity to do so. He's had a great career. Uh, and, and he's definitely someone that I always admired for his uh, work ethic. He tried to bring it, you know, every day. Um, I've played a lot of guys like that. Dimitri's one of them. Another player uh, that was on the move, uh, the Anaheim Ducks to the Minnesota Wild, John Klingberg. I... Always loved Klinger's game. I remember when he kind of caught the NHL by storm. I remember when he signed an, an sort of oddly long, this has become more common now, but oddly long contract after, you know, very, not little, but um, I guess you could say little NHL experience to date uh, when guys just weren't signing, you know, seven-year deals at that time. Um, I remember being in Dallas with Johnny. Just He treated me really well, and uh, I think I've thanked him for that in person, but if not, He's a listener of the podcast, John. Thanks, dude. Uh, you treat me really well during a sensitive time in my career. There was a interesting story where we were, we were both injured. I had a broken ankle. I think John's was his hand at the time. I had surgery. I can't remember if he did. And uh, again, highlighting that adverse happenings will go on in your career, and that this is a norm and not a, a rarity. Uh, John and I are both in the press box. I had just started with Dallas. This was a, a big move for me after getting moved from uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs. And John is highlighting, he's, he's kind of pumping my tires up in the press box. Like, you know, Connor, I, I, I love the way you've played so far. I think he'd be a, a great option even on our second power play. Um, you know, it, it just, you know, try and run with it when you get back, like stay positive. And I was injured a, a, a long, long time and Dallas decided to go a, a different direction. But I'll never forget the fact that, you know, one of our best offensive players, one of the best offensive players in the league uh, really had envisioned me as potentially being uh, a second power play option. Now, I had been on the power play uh, a bit in Toronto, a lot to start. Uh, didn't I was playing the half wall at that time, kind of like the Ovechkin spot, which was a spot I was really unfamiliar with. Struggled with it a little bit. Actually played the bumper in the middle, uh, or the diamond spot as it's called, in the one three one. Was really unfamiliar there. Thought it was a blast. Uh, tried to watch a lot of you know, someone that I thought did it well at the time, uh, Patrick Sharp. But, you know, as the years went on in Toronto, you know, the forward group really expanded in terms of uh, the depth and just the the quality of, you know, players on their half walls, whether it was, you know, Willie Nylander, Mitch Marner, you know, Austin Matthews, guys were playing higher uh, percentage of the, of the full power play. So there really wasn't a whole lot of power play time uh, to go around there. Washington was similar. You had, you know, Ovechkin played the full two, and then you had, you know, Mike Green and John Carlson splitting time at the top, depending on, you know, who was going real well at the time there. And then even eventually they acquired Kevin Shattenkirk. So they've always had, you know, quite a few high-end right-handed options um, when I was there or when I could have been there. So then, you know, fast forward all the way to Dallas, like I was totally flattered. I thought, uh, you know, one of the best players in the, in the game, you know, one of the best offensive demon that I had looked up to prior to, you know, playing the National Hockey League thought I would be a good you know, power play option. So I'm rooting for Klinger uh, in Minnesota. I, I think they have an interesting team to watch. I've always uh, appreciate kind of the way Bill Guerin uh, approaches business. I've heard, you know, stories on, you know, how he, he treats players and how engaged he is. And, and so I'm, I'm very curious to see how they do. This will parlay itself into a little bit of uh, the personal update I give in the later half of this podcast, as well as the training advice. I want to talk about the whole Blake Coleman, uh, Tanner Janot, uh concept. These players, especially when their contracts are favorable, but these specific types of players, very rugged. Uh, they play a direct north-south game. 
They play an energy or a, or a skating game. They play games that when you go into tough buildings or a game isn't particularly going your way and you've got to go grab pucks back or uh, change momentum, these are the sort of players that, um, for whatever reason, you know, uh, a lot of general managers have coveted uh, with great success uh, over the last few years. So I'm, I'm very interested to see, you know, the tenors and know. Yield was talked about quite a bit on Twitter. I was, I was trying to follow and understand it. I've uh, always appreciated the way Tampa does business as well. Uh, Julian Brisbois seems, you know, extremely sharp. So I was uh, very interested to see uh, his response, you know, on, on why this player was so valuable to them. And um, I'm interested to see. I'm interested to see which teams, you know, decided uh, to add players of this ilk, how they're used and how they um, – you know, able to progress through the playoffs. And then there's, you know, certain teams that uh, maybe weren't as aggressive uh, just given their timeline. Um, I'm interested to see how they do. And the fourth player that I'm I'm really excited to watch uh, this come playoff time is Patrick Kane uh, for the New York Rangers. Some guys just have that it factor. Patrick Kane has had it his whole career. He has that MJ, Kobe Bryant, you know, aura and makeup. Uh, I'm really interested to see this guy uh, in, a, in a tight playoff game or a series and, and see what happens. Um, and and I, I hope, you know, he's able to play late. I hope, hope we're able to see, you know, Artemi Panarin and, and him uh, do their thing. Uh, but having, I would train in similar circles in the city of Chicago in the summer. If he doesn't win, I'm very interested to see a, a player of his makeup, a player with his level of determination, a player as competitive and surgical, really, in Patrick Kane. Like, he really, he does the work, but he, he really sits and reflects on his process, and he is very diligent in recruiting the best people to help uh, take his game to the next step. There's a lot of comment on, uh, you know, how his hip or uh, just his general physical health was feeling. The guy has played a ton of hockey over the last decade, uh, and, and you know, probably the one prior to that as well, because um, he, he's always been a perennial winner. I'm very excited to see how there really are only two diverging scenarios. One, he's a part of a Stanley Cup team. Two, he's not, and they lose. And I'm interested to see how the momentum of either will affect his training, and I hope I'm able to see it. Uh, he's called Chicago home for a long time, uh, and, I, and I hope he's back there and we're able to skate together. Admittedly, um, I was a little bit emotional uh, seeing him move on from the club. I actually have gotten, you know, texts from uh, some other childhood teammates of mine who couldn't believe it as well and, and felt similarly. He was just s such an icon in Chicago. He forever will be. Uh, I remember overnight, really, the Duncan Keith, Brent Seabrook, uh, Johnny Taze, Patrick Kane, when they really started to establish themselves before the Winter Classic and especially thereafter as – you know, the team to beat uh, in the National Hockey League uh, for years and years to come and, and really the model to emulate. It was really exciting times uh, to be a Chicago kid. I grew up in the 90s, early 2000s. The Blackhawks were not on TV. Uh, the home games were not televised. The Blackhawks were not my team. And when they really started to arrive, uh, the, the fandom in Chicago blew up and people were so excited. They resonated uh, with the team. They were on billboards all of a sudden. Um... Chicago Blackhawks, you know, come my high school years, became everything I wanted them to be in my in my childhood. And Patrick Kane was a, a huge part of that. A player I put in the same camp was, I was just very curious about uh, a Nate McKinnon uh, last year where it, it seemed like he had reached this fork in, the, uh, in his career, a fork in the road rather, where he was either going to win and become this, you know, possessed monster thereafter because he had the fuel of, having been there, wanting to protect it, wanting to add to his legacy, or it was still going to be this roadblock for him that he was no longer interested in opening the door. He wanted to kick the door down. And so I'm very interested um, to see how Kaner does. Uh, and I say that respectfully as a, as a member of uh, the Boston Bruins you know, organization. Obviously, uh, you know, we'll see if a call-up's in, in, intact. We'll see if uh, I, can, I can help the team win. At some point, I obviously hope so, every player in the minor does, uh, but to be able to learn from and see what the Boston Bruins have done uh, all year has been incredible. And having been around the buzz of the training camp and, and the willingness to, to put the work in and, and 
really, there was just a, a clarity I felt in the players' roles um, where the, they all knew what they added and were prepared to do it at, to the best of their ability. Not unsimilar to listening to, I think Kevin Bx that gave his speech, I was listening to uh, the Vancouver Canucks where he was really highlighting, you know, the Sedin twins. They were our high-skilled, you know, power play guys. They worked day in, day out to be th- not just our power play guys, but the best power play skill guys in the league uh, where they were consistently evaluating their play off the rush, their play in zone, face off plays they could add, any way that they could become more and more lethal uh, in their ability to score. Now you go on to, you know, Burroughs and Ryan Kessler, more energy guys, you know, even Kevin Bieksa, energy role players, you know, still tremendously high skilled, uh, but you know, they were going to put their will before their skill uh, to steal a, a Mike Babcock quote. And uh, just the level of intensity with which they train to be, you know, of all the in-shape guys in the league, they want to be the most in shape. And of all the good face-off players in the league, they want to be the best face-off players. And of all the shutdown demon in the league, they wanted to be the hardest to play against. And uh, I, I really saw that in Boston all throughout their lineup. We've seen it all season long. And uh, we'll see. I think we're in for... Uh, a tremendous uh, Stanley Cup playoff. So that is the first bit uh, for our podcast today uh, on some different trade deadline evaluations. And I want to parlay this into a quote I was reading on on Twitter. So I've kind of been able to find some different physiologists and sports scientists that I really admire and respect on Twitter. There was like a, a list a couple years ago I was reading. It was like the top 100 sports scientists in the world with all their Twitter handles. And I went ahead and you know, followed 70 of them. Um, so there's a, a gentleman named Alan Cousins. He's at Alan, A-L-A-N underscore Cousins, C-O-U-Z-E-N-S on Twitter. He's a physiologist, works primarily with, uh, it appears to be cyclists and swimmers uh, or endurance athletes. Um, and he is very data-driven, which is interesting to me because I have not, in hockey or even in my own particular off-season training, uh, really gone through a real uh, a scientific data-driven approach where the amount of data was taken was just you know as expansive as it seems Allen's practices and he had a quote looking at average seasonal variation HRV which means heart rate variability and resting heart rate uh, RHR across my group of athletes if you're in a HRV low spot at the moment you're not along late winter which is as I record this podcast is where we're at is where HRV often bottoms out, and HRV is generally accepted as a metric uh, for uh, gauging athletic uh, readiness or, or really nervous system readiness for anything. If you're to you know go into a high stakes uh, business environment, you know how flappable might you be? How uh, able will you be to emotionally regulate? Um, and then he finishes the tweet with, "On the positive, spring is just around the corner," and so. I don't track my HRV. I don't have uh, equipment, I think, advanced enough. I know Aura Ring says they've done a good job uh, with their new update. I've heard from other sports scientists and physiologists I've discussed with this with that all of the measurements um, devices are not sophisticated enough to, to get a reliable reading. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. But I was in this boat uh, anecdotally. Some of the uh, central nervous uh, system signs of fatigue are obvious, lethargy uh, to train, shortness with self or others socially. Uh, I'm com- I was able, I was completing you know tasks that were you know let's say it was the same practice as the week before but with greater difficulty. Um, there are some little soft tissue injuries that sometimes for me uh, will show up when I'm a little run down might be the more common term. Uh, right bicep tendonitis generally from taking a bunch of one timers. Uh, right groin soreness just from skating. Uh, and, and just heavy legs that are obvious, uh, you know, during practice where I've, you know, felt like I was buzzing before, or, you know, my favorite would be to use the the stair test. I think if for whatever reason, the stairs feel heavy, you're kind of clumsy, you know, going up them. Um, this is a good sign, uh, you know, that your readiness to train just might not be there. And so those are the facts. We can talk about, uh, you know, some different tools I've used uh, to go on offense for anyone who follows me on Instagram, I talk a lot about red light uh, therapy. It's become a, a mini obsession of mine. It appears that all the different biohacking circles uh, I, I read about, uh, they really tend to be circling in on uh, red light therapy as a respectable option. I use the wave 
uh, option. I will. Uh, I, I post the link oftentimes on my uh, Instagram. It's it's really appropriately priced. Uh, you know, which is really the reason I, I you know went with Wave. Um, red light therapy is proven to improve uh, dopamine levels in the brain, which functions on two levels simultaneously. I learned this from the Andrew uh, Huberman Lab podcast, which I understand a lot of listeners from this podcast also, you know, will steal some information there. Dopamine functions on two levels. So there, the one would be like there's a, a wave pool and over time, uh, the water level can kind of uh, dip if you are chronically dipping into uh, the, you know, needing to use uh, dopamine and all of a sudden your, your pool is kind of lacking uh, the amount of water you or, or dopamine rather that you might need uh, to be able to you know feel like uh, training feel like going out into the world and, and having uh, you know having the desire to pursue which is really what dopamine is famous for and then there's also a secondary way in which dopamine functions uh, and again this is all uh, available at the human lab podcast where he talks about this for hours and at at much greater length from a neuroscience perspective. Uh, But part of the goal in having a dopamine system that works properly is be able to reach, you know, really intense uh, peaks, uh, which is important as an athlete. Um, I want to both have a general desire to lean into life and do the things that I want to do, pursue the, pursue the goals and relationships that I want to have, as well as achieve these really athletic, uh, the high demanding uh, dopaminergic sort of uh, endeavors. So red light therapy has been helpful for me. Uh, Naps as well. Uh, Generally, I will shoot for 20 minutes or 90 minutes. That's because a a REM cycle, I understand, is about that long. Uh, A lot of the research is uh, trying to help an athlete or or any person. The goal of the nap is to feel better um, athletically as well as avoid... um, you know, sort of lethargy thereafter the nap. I know, you know, not everyone, uh, you know, tends to identify as a napper, but I kind of view naps like pizza, like even when they're bad, uh, they're good. Um, this can also look like non-sleep deep rest, aka yoga nidra. Uh, Kelly Boys has a section, excuse me, called deep rest on the waking up app uh, with Sam Harris, which I keep on my phone. I love that one. Uh, I think there's a 15 minute one, uh, settling the nervous system, sort of like body scan, breathing coordination deal. Huge fan. If I don't think I can nap, I'll, I'll use that. And then uh, protein support satiation and level blood sugars, uh, blood sugar levels, aids with restful sleep. And flatly, protein tends to help uh, retain muscle mass and helps me be as powerful, um, you know, game in, game out, and, and helping me recover from my training. Uh, I think. This time of year, it's real easy to sort of limp into the finish line. It's something I did in schoolwork, I remember. Like my locker would get messy, my folders would get messy. And this year, I'm trying to make it a point to really f- bring freshness to each day, uh, to each practice, to each game uh, the best I can. And so, red light therapy, napping, uh, protein um, ha- have been helpful. Another tool I want to share is this concept of like, a, I call it like a, a, the shock and awe method where uh, it's a weaponized shorter day uh, where I will really uh, intens- intensify my focus. So I'll show up, let's call it even 10 minutes later than normal uh, to the rank grant. All my equipment is sorted and you know there's not a meeting I'm running late for. That's not an option. Um, but my goal is to not come into the rink and get ready, but to come in the rink and be ready, come in caffeinated, hydrated, having had breakfast at home, maybe, you know, playing goalie for Charlie, that kind of deal. Um, ready to jump in my warm up. The goal here is to be, you know, focused with my practice, not to linger on the ice after uh, forcing uh, a higher volume of, you know, spinal stabilization on my skates. Um, you know, this is something I'll also use if I'm trying to avoid uh, lace bite or something, you know, chronic. Uh, that's, that's really an issue. Uh, the goal here is just disruption of routine. I think routine is great. As humans, we crave and do better with a sense of routine, but at certain points um, in one's life, you just want to break. Um, and so this is a way to add some variance uh, in my week. Visualizing is also a secret weapon here. So the ability uh, to grow my game or, or practice uh, tasks that I want to without the physical task of uh, tax of having to actually uh, be on the ice, taking the physical beating of, let's call it uh, sprint work up the ice or taking one timers. I will literally just sit there and 
mentally go through the reps. Like what would a perfect one timer feel like? How do my skates have to be tied? And what is flowing on top of the ice feel like where I'm I'm coordinated and powerful and I've got that almost like I'm skating on a moving walkway type feeling. You know, when you go to the airport and you can walk and grind it out, you know, or you can, you know, go on the moving walkway and feel what it's like to be Miro Iskin and on the ice. Uh, that is the, the type of visualization I'm looking for. I really want to use uh, the imagination. Uh, th- this is where I'm trying to use my imagination instead of my work ethic uh, to drive uh, nervous system uh, change. Uh, what else we got? Uh, reading. We do not have a finite amount of energy. I believe this. Reading, napping, uh, healthy eating. These are all energetic investments which return more energy uh, than they require. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to use both fiction to encourage a uh, relaxation effect. I'm actually looking for a good fiction book. So if you have one, uh, fle- feel free to message me on Instagram or you can email me at connorcarrickmedia at gmail.com. That is my podcast email. Um, trying to infuse my psyche with new stories. Uh, around how I want to be a finisher. Oh, the other book I'm reading right now is uh, Relentless by Tim Grover. I'm in the dying pages of that one. And then I'm going to read uh, Winning, which is his next book. I've really liked Relentless. Uh, those two books uh, will allude a lot to Dwayne Wade, uh, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. Uh, similarly scheduled sport, a very different dynamic uh, in terms of the physical demands. But I think there's a lot to be learned uh, from basketball. And just the sort of license uh, certain players have to uh, be their best, um, you know, day in, day out uh, for careers. I just think it's it's really interesting to see what a piercing and dominant mental state uh, that's so common and easy to find in basketball just because the stars are um, so involved in, in, in each and every play. I think it's a sport that's uh, been fun for me to, to look at. And then the last thing I've really tried to do uh, to stay fresh is just address injuries. Again, it's a it's a huge limiting factor this uh, time of the season. Our coach, Jordy Kinnear, last year at the Charlotte Checkers used to have a saying, like, if you feel 100% this time of year, you probably haven't been playing hard enough. I think that's true. Um, if, if you're playing hard, you're finishing checks, you're trying to have a good stick on puck, uh, you're trying to block shots, you know, things are going to happen, things are going to creep up. Uh, this is also a time of year where nervous system-wise, when the output is so high, you've been playing chronically all year, uh, this is where old injuries you can kind of rear their head. I mentioned the bicep tendonitis. Uh, my right ankle's always taken a little bit more homework uh, in terms of my physical preparation ever since I had surgery. So that's something um, I am I am tending to uh, this time of the year. And I, I wanted to share this sort of anti-fatigue equation that I think of as freshness equals uh, novelty plus energetic investments uh, all multiplied by uh, our personal values or stories. And at some point, as a listener, uh, as an athlete myself, we both share this decision of how do we want to finish. Um, for a lot of uh, student athletes, it, this applies to your school year. Uh, for a lot of um, you know hockey players, uh, your your season, your hockey season is either ending, uh, and you have an opportunity to finish on your best, uh, you know, with your best foot forward, or if you're like me, I've I've always been really excitable towards the beginning of things. I've always found that a little bit more easy, uh, given my personality. Um, be methodical in your next uh, you know, phase of, of your career. And so this brings me to the third and final segment of today's podcast, which is just some of the uh, training advice. Uh, I get some questions on social media from uh, Division One athletes, major junior athletes, youth athletes. And if you have any personal questions, again, you know, feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, Matt Connor Carrick on Twitter. I'm at Connor Carrick on Instagram, or you can email me, uh, connorcarrickmedia at gmail.com, uh, and we can you know discuss uh, you know what's on your mind, how I can help you. Uh, more specifically, uh, training advice, three things. Number one would be get healthy and lean. Uh, number two would be get a bunch of sunlight. And number three would be study the playoffs, please. Uh, and let's, let's talk about that. So number one, get healthy and lean. Uh, if parts don't work, I will try to fix them. Uh, and the the second part of that is is you know getting lean that can be closely related to just trying to improve your diet. I think it's easy uh, as the season goes on, the energy energetic demands are so high. Uh, just looking again for those breaks in routines, it's easy it, it, to let the sugar get out of control. It's easy to let 
um, you know, an afternoon or, or, or an after game uh, cocktail to kind of creep into uh, a player's routine. These are for older players, over 21, I'm hoping. And uh, this is something as a pro I, I've, I've seen, and it's always a sort of just a good time uh, to spring clean, tidy up your diet, and, and tend to injuries. You're not going to be able to uh, train your body with broken parts in the same way you wouldn't be able to drive your car if you don't have four wheels. Like you, you need that. If you got you know one flat, you're going to have a hard time uh, getting the most out of the other three. So get your body uh, as healthy as possible and uh, you know get lean or at a bare minimum, you know lower some of the inflammation that tends to creep up uh, chronically over the course of the season. Second would be sunlight. Hockey is an indoor sport dominated by um, cold winter climates. Our vitamin D3 levels are terrible. Uh, you know, generally, I've been a part of, uh, you know, every team I've been a part of does blood work uh, regarding vitamin D3 levels, and they're not great. And supplementation is not, uh, while it's a good step, is not sufficient. You need to get outside. Number three would be, please, please, please study the playoffs. I loved uh, training as a kid during the playoffs. Uh, I remember taping certain playoff games, especially during those Chicago Blackhawk days, thinking I couldn't skip my own trading sessions because if I wanted to play in the playoffs versus just watching them, uh, I couldn't skip my own work. A couple of things I remember learning was, one, the best shooters in the world rely on sneaky releases to score. To be a great scorer in the NHL, you, know, you do have to have a great shot, but they also rely on their, their hockey sense and their craftiness uh, to beat what I would consider an unready goalie, right? Like you can imagine in the MLB, they're trying to do this with the different, uh, you know, pitch clock manipulation techniques with the different uh, windups you're seeing. Marcus Stroman's a pitcher that comes to mind, you know, very crafty in how he delivers to the plate at different cadences, different timings, different leg lift heights. Um, anything you can do to beat an unready goalie or in the pitching scenario, if you could, if you could throw to an unready uh, hitter or batter, uh, that's going to improve your likelihood um, in in scoring and throwing the ball by them. So this is something that uh, I've, I say this today also as a reminder to myself, I've been a little pretty, I will call it, in my desire to score instead of relying on the work that the passer has done to manipulate the goalie and getting a shot, even though it may not be you know particularly perfect. Uh, ideally, I would have my head up and, and kind of have an idea where I want to shoot ahead of time uh, but I've just been a little cute, as, as coaches might say, uh, in my delivery to the net. And so this is something uh, I'm trying to remember. I'm thinking of Patrick Kane in 2010, right? I'm not sure if I said that already, but, um, you know, the Philadelphia Flyers, left shot defenseman for Philly uh, on the half wall, kind of dances him up near the blue line. He's coming down towards the goal line. Not, you know, he's, he's well outside the dot, uh, not percentage-wise a, a, a really desirable scoring area. Just for whatever reason, he had a feeling, you know, five hole on the ice, something ugly, uh, something underneath, you know, where the goalie's line of sight might be. Bang, he wins a, he wins a Stanley Cup. Number two for youth players, something I want you to notice is uh, interference, purposeful interference uh, all over the rink, particularly off faceoffs and particularly in the neutral zone. Uh, every team is uh, aware of trying to win blue lines and not turn pucks over in the neutral zone. So you're going to see pucks get in. There's a physical investment where, again, these you know really physical players that we mentioned in seg uh, segment one of this podcast are required. Uh, players that really want to get in and, and be physical and, and impose themselves on defensemen to let them know over the course of the seven-game series, if you want to go back and scrape pucks off the yellow, there is going to be a physical price or risk uh, to pay. Um, this is where players off the puck can do a really nice job being roadblocks. Um, gives your defenseman time to you know peel pucks off the yellow, like I mentioned. But also, if that player that you're holding up does decide to go and hit your defenseman, they have less momentum. The hit's not going to be as violent, and so you're going to watch a lot of. Uh, you know, there's going to be no free passes out there. It's going to be, you know, a, a muddy track. I was a Mike Babcock and uh, uh, saying back in the day where. Uh, this was the first time I was really exposed to this concept at the, at the National Hockey League level was um, purposely taking routes where you're just delaying four checkers a stride or two or forcing them to take the long way uh, to go get your players. Uh, and then the third thing I really want uh, our listener to practice and, and see is emotional regulation. 
uh, the breath work I advocate on this podcast, I advocate for on this podcast, the meditation practice that I advocate for on this podcast, the physical training so that you're not in a stress state uh, when games really matter, when the building has 40,000 people in it, when the building has bad ice because it's 90 degrees outside and it's June. Um, these are when really high-end athletes will show that the stress uh, might be getting to them. Or uh, it, it sometimes it can look like frustration. Sometimes it can look like uh, you know just blunt emotional dysregulation. And there's a couple scenarios where you think of really high-end players um, you know, making the postseason harder on them and their team. And you think of uh, Mark Shifley hitting Jake Evans at the end of a, of a Montreal game. I mean, Mark Shifley's a stud. I, yeah, I would uh, trade careers with him in a heartbeat. Um, you know, just based off of uh, the success he's been able to have at the National Hockey League level. But, you know, it was pretty clear thereafter uh, with the ramifications, and I forget what the suspension length was, but, you know, he, he wished that he hadn't done what he did. Uh, Nazem Kadri is another one, uh, you know, very much had the last laugh in, in Colorado. I, I love playing with Dream. I think he's a stud. Um, I loved watching him all the way back when he was, you know, uh, uh, pulling breakaway moves. Uh, for the World Junior Team, uh, for Team Canada, uh, in the London Knights, he was a player I've, you know, style-wise, always thought was cool, wore 91, um, a lot to like about Kadri, but, you know, till the end of time, uh, having played with him, I'm sure that he wishes he could have a do-over uh, with some of the hits that he had as a Leaf. He always, uh, you know, played on the line, uh, wanted to intimidate his opponent, but, you know, there's a, there's a line that you cannot cross where you start to hurt your team or remove yourself uh, from important games. And as an important player, you, you just can't do that. So uh, we'll see what happens. There's always big moments. There's always uh, decisions that make or break uh, playoff series. For certain teams in the National Hockey League, I think we are primed for a tremendous uh, Stanley Cup playoff. I'm more excited uh, to watch hockey this spring than I, than I can remember. I'm more invested in the, the, the different storylines. Um, and so that's it to all the kids, uh, you know, training, uh, this coming off season, I wish you all the best. I hope your season went well. Uh, if I can help you in any way, let me know. Um, some different podcasts I've been listening to would be the hockey think tank podcast, uh, who's one of the hosts, Jeff Lavecchio I had on recently. I think, uh, they release a lot of great information for, uh, for youth athletes. Uh, and then again, for some of the story to lines that uh, are developing, I'm a big fan of Elliot Freeman and Jeff Merrick with, uh, 32 thoughts. I, I tried to uh, parlay off some of the uh, you know topics that they had covered come uh, trade deadline. So that wraps it up for another session, another uh, episode with the Curious Competitor Podcast. Thank you to our listener for listening. Uh, if you can leave five stars and subscribe, it does a lot of help uh, in helping me grow this podcast. Please share this uh, with your teammates, with your coach. Uh, if you're a player and found this effective, uh, or if you're a parent with your other parents uh, on the team, I always... I, I really do feel this. If you have a, a community of players that you can invest in, in development with and kind of uh, agree upon you know, best practices, uh, it really enriches the learning environment. So to have parents on the same page, to have teammates on the same page, I think only further your development. So I look forward to doing it again soon.